to our featured speakers tonight. Uh, we have Svetlana and also uh, Shatabi. So first of all, Svetlana, she is a PhD software engineer in statistical and machine learning algorithms. She worked for SPSS and then IBM for 18 years. Most recently, she was a developer advocate at IBM and currently she's a senior data scientist for a small startup. She's looking forward uh, towards her next company as a principal data scientist. She's also a co-organizer co and community lead of CDRUG and a speaker at multiple meetup groups and conferences in the U.S. and abroad. Then we have Shatabi Chowdhury. Shatabi is currently a senior data scientist at the United Health Group. Uh, she's she was previously an advisory software engineer at IBM for many years, specializing in Cognos Analytics, Watson Analytics, and SPSS family of products. She's a speaker at multiple meetup groups and also an advocate for women in data science. She has a blog about machine learning and currently a part-time PhD candidate at DePaul University and holds a master's degree in predictive analytics from Northwestern University. So now we will um, have Shatabi and or Svalana take the stage. And again, thank you very much for coming to speak for us. Uh, so everyone, welcome to the meetup today. So we have uh, three meetup groups, as Mary mentioned. I have it in my slides also, because I, I didn't know like what are those three. Uh, so these are the three meetup groups. Uh, and these are about, this is about me, uh, and Mary already told um, a lot about us. Uh, so if you want to reach uh, me, uh, this is my LinkedIn um, uh, info, and you can also reach me uh, through email. Um, and if you have any questions uh, when I present, please enter them in the chat window. One of us will monitor and the questions and we will get back to you. Uh, okay, uh, so let's begin. So I first want to acknowledge that uh, many of the slides are prepared by Dave Carlson. Uh, he's enterprise solution architect in Databricks. Uh, he has other commitments today, so he couldn't make it. Um, so, oh, here is the agenda. I will start with introduction to Spark. Uh, then I will go over RDD, data frame, data set, and koalas. Uh, then I will hand over to Shetlana for, um, for machine learning libraries and other topics. Uh, so what is Spark? Spark was originally developed at the University of California, Barclays AMP Lab. Uh, AMP Lab focuses on three dimensions to improve data analysis. Uh, the first one is algorithms. Uh, this is to improve scale, efficiency, and quality. The second one is machines uh, to scale up data centers. And the third one is people to leverage human activity and intelligence. Uh, here is a bit of project uh, history. Uh, Spark codebase started in 2009 and open sourced in 2010. Uh, uh, it was later donated to Apache Software Foundation, which has maintained it since. So why does it matter? Uh, the technical factors behind Spark are data and algorithm, which makes the program. Now, computing applications which spend most of their execution time to computations are compute intensive. Whereas the application which require large volume of data and spend most of their processing time to IO on and manipulation of data are data intensive. Spark and the Spark and Cloud are perfectly, they perfectly solve this scenario. And here is a bit more history of Spark and Databricks. Spark was initially started by um, uh, Jaharia at UC Berkeley's AMP Lab in 2009. Uh, it, it was open source in, in 2010 under a BSD license. Uh, and then it was donated to Apache Software, which you just uh, said. Um, in February 2014, Spark became a top level Apache project. And then in November 2014, Spark founder 
uh, Jaharia's company Databricks set a new world record in large scale sorting using Spark. Spark has in excess of 1000 contributors in 2015, making it one of the most active projects in the Apache Software Foundation and one of the most active open source big project. Uh, this is um, about Spark. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, history uh, about Spark. Uh, but how does Spark help? Uh, so here, see, here is what is Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a unified analysis engine for large scale data processing. The Data Frame API provides a simplified interface to work with big data, turning many machines into single logical processing engine. Spark ML provides machine learning algorithms for processing big data. The streaming API gives us end-to-end -end fault tolerance and the possibility for multi-millisecond latency. And all these work together seamlessly. Spark comes with some advantages. The first one to mention is speed. It can run workloads 100 times faster. Apache Spark achieves high performance for both batch and streaming data using a state-of-art scheduler, a query optimizer, and a physical execution machine. And it is easy to use. You can write application using Java or Scala or Python or R. And it, it, is, it has a generality um, advantage also. It has, it has a stack of libraries, including SQL, DataFrame, and MLLeaf for machine learning, and GraphX and Spark streaming. And it can run everywhere. It can run on Hadoop, uh, Apache Mesos, uh, Kubernetes, standalone, or in the cloud. The secret of Spark's awesome performance is parallelism. Uh, here are some uh, brief Spark basics. Uh, uh, so driver is the leader. It coordinates the activity of the executors and executors are the follower. Uh, so the driver is used for operations that require consolidating data or coordinating uh, with the executors, uh, they can sometimes be the bottleneck of our job. And the executors are the followers. They receive directions from the driver. They are in charge of running individual tasks uh, in a given Spark job. Uh, and they are scalable compute, which allows our job to process large amount of data. Uh, so how to how to write Spark? Uh, as we mentioned before, and maybe and maybe uh, most of you know that uh, Spark supports many languages: Scala, uh, Python, R, SQL, and Java. Uh, okay, now we are uh, moving to uh, RDD, uh, which is uh, which stands for Resilient Distributed Data Source Data Sets RDD. Uh, so what is RDD? Uh, at the core, RDD is, a, is an immutable distributed collection of elements of data. There are partitions across nodes to operate in parallel. And it, is, uh, it can be operated with a low-level API that offers transformation and actions. Uh, so when do we use RDD? Uh, there are some scenarios when you want to use RDDs. Uh, the first one would be if your data is unstructured, such as media streams or streams of text, or uh, you want to um, do low-level transformation um, and actions, or you want to manipulate your data with some functional programming. And again, if if you don't you don't want to uh, care about imposing a scheme schema because it needs a schema, uh, and also you you you, do, you can forego some optimization and performance benefits uh, which are available in data frame and data sets, uh, which we will see in the next slide. So when you don't care about all those optimization, you can use uh, RDD. 
uh, uh, here we see history of uh, Spark's main APIs, RDD, data frame, and data set. Uh, so RDD was the primary user-facing API in Spark since its inception. Uh, RDD, since our RDD APIs use schema explicitly, so therefore a user needs to define a schema manually to use the RDD. Data frame comes next. In data frame, there is no need to specify a schema. Generally, it discovers the schema automatically. And the data sets, uh, next come data set. They are types of version of Spark uh, structured API for Java and Scala. We will see those uh, in the next few slides. Uh, so what happened, uh, what happened to RDDs in Apache Spark 2.0? Are they being deprecated? Uh, the answer is no, they are not deprecated. What's more is that we can seamlessly move between data frame uh, or data set to RDD by simple API method. Uh, so we can go from a data frame to RDD via uh, RDD method, and we can go from RDD to data frame via the 2DF method. Uh, now we are going to talk, uh, discuss data frame. The data frames are, although inspired by uh, R and Python pandas, they are designed from the ground up to support modern big data and data science application. A data frame is the most common structured API and simply represents a table of data with rows and columns. And they work in all uh, Spark, Scala, uh, Python, R, and Java. There are few ways you can create data frame uh, in Spark. Um, it can be created using different data formats. Uh, for example, um, a CSV data, JSON data, or RDBML data, or any kind of data. Or you can load data from existing RDD, or you can programmatically specify a schema. Now we're going to see some examples in, um, of data frame in Python. The first step in any Apache programming is to create a Spark context. Okay, a Spark context, Spark context is required when we want to execute operations in a cluster. Spark context tells, uh, tells Spark how and where to access a cluster. And the first step is to connect um, with the Apache cluster. So if you're using Spark shell, you will notice that it's already created. Otherwise, we can create the Spark context by importing, initializing, and providing the configuration settings. So this is the Spark context. Uh, the, the entry point of all the relational functionality in Spark uh, is the SQL context. Oh, sorry, SQL context class. Um, to create basic SQL context, you just need the Spark context. So these are uh, sort of set up before you uh, create before you um, create your data frame. Uh, uh, so creating data frame from RDD. Uh, so uh, here um, I'm starting with uh, I don't have an RDD, so I'm starting to first create the RDD. So I create uh, first step is you create a list of tuples. And then each tuple has some information here. I have name, person name, and age. Uh, and then you create the RDD from the from the list above. And then you convert the uh, the um, tuples to a row. Uh, and then you use the create data frame API of SQL context to create the data frame. So if you if you output the type of the schema people object here, you will see this is the data frame. Uh, now creating data frame from a CSV. Uh, so if you want to create, if you want to read a CSV file in Apache Spark, you need to specify a library in your Python cell. Uh, so uh, that is uh, you have to download a Spark CSV package. 
uh, and extract the, that package in the home directory of Spark, uh, and then you will be able to read that. So here I'm reading um, the, the CSV file, uh, and the, the path variable you see here um, is the location of the folder where your train or test uh, CSV uh, decide. Uh, and the header is true, which means the CSV file contains the header. Uh, and we are using infer schema uh, true, uh, meaning we are telling the SQL context, which we saw in the previous screen, uh, uh, we are telling the SQL context to automatically detect the data type for each column in the data frame. If we do not set the inferred schema to true, then all the columns will be, uh, will be uh, read as a string, okay? So the same way the test um, data frame is, is read. Uh, now the fun part, the data frame manipulation. Uh, so data, data frame manipulation functions are similar to the one we, we can see in, uh, in Pandas. Uh, so to see first few in observation, we can, we can use head or you can use show. Uh, there are some, uh, you can use count to get number of rows in data frame and here a number of columns. Uh, these are uh, uh, some basic uh, manipulation. Uh, now we will see the SQL integration. Uh, so as we spoke before that we need to create a SQL context. So you can keep, keep your SQL query uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the course and you can write SQL context.sql uh, and inside that you keep the query and that will return a data frame, uh, the result as a data frame. You can also uh, do it a different way that is, you can register uh, register um, um, as table operation uh, and use the table to register, and then you can use the similar um, SQL uh, command to get uh, and write the and write the uh, SQL query in quotes and get the data frame. So the result set in the first DF one is we are just selecting one field from the train table, and the second one we are selecting maximum purchase of, um, of each age group from this uh, particular table. And the result set would be in DF2. Uh, so data frame from table in Hive, this is uh, uh, quite commonly used uh, possibly in our, at our work where we have to get the table from Hive. Uh, so there, there are also different ways to do that. Uh, so the first one is, is the easier one, which you saw before. We write the query and we, um, in the quotes, uh, uh, and then we uh, use SQL context.sql, and this user is the result um, uh, data frame. Okay, or we can, use, uh, we, can, we can use a different way. That is, we have to create a Hive context. So the Hive context, we, have to use, we can create it uh, using the Spark context, and there we use hive context dot table, uh, and then we enter the table we are interested. Here we are interested in the, in the users table. So these are all using Python. Similar APIs are available in Scala, in Scala and Java. Uh, here are some more manipulation using uh, the table uh, in Hive. Uh, so um, uh, uh, so here we we have used filter. Um, um, uh, and fil uh, filter and also select and group by and different kind of manipulation to get the demographic data uh, from a large population of users. Okay. Uh, so once, uh, once you have your uh, data, data frame, you can also save the data frame as a new Hive table. Uh, this is um, one way to do that, and you can also verify if your uh, before you uh, write it to the table, you can verify if your results are correct. Uh, so in general, it is recommended to use data frame compared to RDD, uh, wherever possible, because data frame has a built-in query optimization. Uh, now we're going to see data set. We're going to see it briefly. Uh, so data sets are type set version of Spark's structured API for Java and Scala, okay? 
Yeah, when Scala. This API is not available in Python and R because um, the, they are dynamically typed language, uh, but it's a powerful tool for writing large application uh, in Scala and Java. Uh, next, we're going to see um, koalas. Uh, so, oh, as, you, as we know that uh, we data scientists, we like pandas, uh, Python pandas. We know it lacks parallelism. We know it does not scale, but we still like pandas. Uh, so here a typical journey of a data scientist. Uh, first, we learn the skills of data science. We learn the technical scale. We also learn the theoretical foundation. Most of the time, we are taught using only one library for working with data frame in Python, and it is Pandas. It is the de facto standard for Python in the data science ecosystem. And then we graduate, uh, uh, graduate from college, start participating in the workforce or doing some competition in Kaggle, uh, and we are typically dealing with small or medium data set which is exactly what Pandas is designed for, small and medium data set. And then we come to work where we need to analyze large data set uh, in production, which is hosted uh, in some data lake. Then we realize we are stuck because Pandas is fundamentally a single node, single threaded in memory implementation of data frames. It just does not scale to larger amount of data. So we ask around and uh, with our more uh, experienced colleagues and they tell us that we should use Spark. It's what we all use and that's, they also have a data frame API in Spark and they are very similar. So go ahead and use that. So let us, let us remind ourselves what is Pandas. Pandas is a standard Python tool for data manipulation and analysis. It's very easy to install, it's easy to write, and it has a huge community to get help. And let us also remind ourselves what is Spark. It's the de facto unified analytic engine for large scale data processing, which does streaming, ETL, machine learning, and it is the standard for distributed workloads. So what's wrong with PySpark? PySpark, it's the meaning the Python in the Spark. So there is nothing wrong, but the integration is not seamless. We cannot write the same Python code with pandas and port it in Spark. They both have different data frames and they, they, they both have data frames, but they do not like this, they not, do not look the same. So here are some examples of pandas versus Spark. So you can see there are like some strong differences. Uh, and in many other ways, sometimes you might, you might see Spark is simpler. Sometimes you feel Pandas is simpler, but they're different enough that we have to re relearn the PySpark. Um, and the, our knowledge of Pandas wouldn't help, would, would, would help, but we still have to relearn re re a lot of things. And all these subtle differences create a lot of problem. It's not that we cannot learn a new API, but it creates a friction. So we just want to get the job done and not to have learned a you know, million different frameworks and APIs. So to fix, to fix that problem and make our job easier, here comes Koalas. Koalas is a pure Python package that implements the Pandas API on top of Apache Spark. It basically makes the Pandas API scalable to big data, which it, which it didn't, wasn't before. So that's a seamless transition between small and large data. So by using Koalas, data scientists can make the transition from single machine to distributed environment without needing to learn a new framework. And so here is the, here is Koalas architecture. And uh, let's see an example of pandas and PySpark. Uh, what we were seeing that there are some uh, strong differences between these two data frames. Now we're going to see uh, pandas and koalas. 
Uh, the idea is that your code base should be able to seamlessly work between smaller data set and larger data set with very minor modification. And Koala's servers that. Uh, and to wrap everything up, there are some key differences between Pandas and Spark that we should be aware of. Uh, first of all, Spark is lazy. So most of the operations won't be executed uh, until um, Spark is called. Um, uh, so by, for example, transformation like limit, select, or drop, these kind of transformation operation will flag but not execute. Whereas action like count or show will trigger a job to process the data. Most operation only happen when displaying or writing a data frame. Another major difference is that Spark does not maintain row order, while Pandas maintain the natural ordering of rows because the rows are made up of arrays. Spark, however, assumes all data is stored in unordered fashion, which is distributed across multiple machines. And because of that, there are some things you can do in Pandas that would come with some penalty if you do them in Spark. And this is the one, this is one of the few places where you have to make a trade off between scaling out uh, or um, with performance. Uh, now I hand over to Shetlana. She will talk about uh, Spark ML and uh, other things. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's talk more about machine learning and how to do it in Spark. Uh, I should warn you that I'm not a very big expert, actually. I'm still learning, so if we run into problems, then I may need to get back to you later about uh, solving them. But hopefully we can figure it out together. So Mary already gave an introduction for myself. Uh, thank you, Mary. Yeah, so I worked at SPSS and IBM for about 20 years. <clears throat> and now I'm uh, looking for new opportunities and also working as a volunteer for a small startup, uh, analyzing their data. That's a lot of fun. And you can find me on Twitter or uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, etc. <clears throat> so today we'll talk briefly about, uh, well, I will give a brief introduction to machine learning and then uh, we'll talk about how machine learning on Spark uh, evolves over time and uh, we'll see some examples sample code in various languages. And then we'll also look at the Databricks community edition. And we, if we want, we can also try to look at um, uh, Watson Studio, which also has a stack environment. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes in terms of time. Uh, OK. We have five minutes to eight, roughly. OK. So. Um, Introduction to machine learning. Uh, according to one of the quotes that I found, uh, machine learning is a process for extracting patterns from data using statistics, linear algebra, and numerical optimization. And I think, in other words, there were uh, uh, formulations like um, making uh, making computers uh, do. Uh, perform some tasks uh, without being explicitly programmed, right? So the idea was that uh, computers would learn from from the data and then use that model to make predictions for new data. And uh, there are often questions about uh, what is machine learning in relation to artificial intelligence, to what is deep learning, etc. And uh, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Both machine learning and artificial intelligence started uh, many, many years ago, back in 1950s, I think. And they had a long history, but uh, most recently, uh, deep learning uh, came up. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And we'll talk about it a little bit at some point, I think. Not much. Uh, but um, anyway, so deep, deep learning, I think, is one of the reasons why machine learning is so popular now. And you might have heard that uh, data scientist is the sexiest profession of 21st century. 
And what is data science? Well, according to this diagram that is often shown, uh, uh, data science is basically machine learning plus domain expertise. Well, of course, different domains have different uh, expertise, but machine learning is still pretty much the same. Uh, do you see uh, just the slide or you see the slide and next slide? I see both. These are oh, next. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I should switch to another window. Or... Oh, that's okay. <clears throat> it's not too small, right? Well, it depends on the size of your monitor, I guess. That's okay. Uh, so, uh, or we could, uh, let me... You can slide yeah. show Solana. mode. I think there is a, yeah. an exchange, change swap the mode or something, I think on your presentation. So. Okay. I think I can uh, just share it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now we don't see anything. Not yet. Oh, we see. Oh, okay, good, good, it's good. Better. Thank you. All good. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, machine learning has uh, many areas, and at some point I found this uh, nice diagram online somewhere on the internet. Uh, so I'm not uh, the author of it, but I think it kind of uh, has a good, uh, <clears throat> gives a good exp impression of what machine learning is. Uh, there are so many different uh, parts of machine learning, and uh, I, I guess the three main parts are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And uh, what are those? Uh, unsupervised learning is uh, when you have some bunch of data, you don't really have any feature, you just uh, want to go through this data and find some interesting patterns in it and figure out some something useful that you can use to improve your business. Uh, but you don't have any specific um, predictions or any target variable or whatever. Uh, with supervised learning, you have a specific, uh, it's like learning with a teacher because you have a set, usually have uh, some smaller structured data and uh, there is a target variable which has uh, specific values for specific inputs and you want to learn to predict this uh, the values of this target variable from the uh, training data that you have. And supervised learning is divided into classification and regression uh, based on the type of the target variable. So if your target variable is a continuous variable, such as a salary or somebody's age or temperature, uh, then uh, those uh, models that are trying to predict continuous target are called regression models. And it, this includes linear regression as well as many other models. And we'll talk about some of them later. And classification models are the models where you have a, a categorical target variable, such as uh, sometimes it's a binary categorical, such as yes or no, zero or one. And sometimes it's a variable with several different categories. And you are trying to predict those and those also, uh, such problems often appear in various kinds of uh, applications, including fraud detection. With fraud detection, you want to decide if something is, should be considered fraud or not, or there is customer retention, uh, some diagnostics, etc. Image classification also, you would have several possible classes, and that would fall into this category as well. And finally, reinforcement learning, uh, this is a very interesting area, which is uh, very different from those two. And I honestly don't know too much about it, but I know that Mary does. So maybe one day Mary will give us a lesson about reinforcement learning, because she has been presenting some things about uh, a program that is playing a Pac-Man game. So I always wanted to learn, but I haven't. So with reinforcement learning, basically, you have to learn a series of steps and you don't get immediate um, response for each step you make, but in the end you want to reach your goal. So one of the examples of reinforcement learning was this famous program that uh, learned to play Go. Uh, Go is a very complicated game. And that program was uh, trained by playing itself uh, millions of millions of times. And it figured out the a strategy that beat uh, the best uh, human player. 
Uh, okay, so those are the areas of machine learning. Now, uh, if we talk a little bit more about specific uh, <coughs> uh, algorithms uh, in those areas, uh, the most typical supervised learning is a clustering model. With clustering model, you just uh, you have a bunch of data and you try to find uh, groups of uh, uh, subjects or groups of uh, your records that are most similar to each other. So in this example, uh, we find, okay, those are all apples and those are all pears probably, and those are all, I'm not sure what kind of fruit that is, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so clustering is an example of unsupervised learning. And then in terms of supervised learning, um, there are many different algorithms. Uh, some of the most popular and simple to understand algorithms are decision trees. And decision trees could be used both for uh, classification models and for uh, regression models. And uh, <clears throat> so they could predict either continuous target or categorical target. And uh, one of the advantages of decision trees is that uh, the pre prediction, predictions are very easy to understand, to explain. And that uh, machine learning explainability is a very important uh, Attribute of machine learning, especially in those highly regulated um, industries such as uh, financial or medical, they want to know not just your prediction, but why you are making this prediction. And uh, if you have a decision tree, you see it's very easy. Okay, is your age uh, less than 15? Yes. Okay. Then are you a boy or a girl? And depending on that, you get some kind of prediction. Well, this picture, I guess, might be um, considered sexist, but hopefully not. It's just known that maybe girls don't play as many video games as boys, but uh, I'm not sure. Maybe all of them do. My daughters play a lot of games. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> but then uh, one uh, decision tree often does not provide a very good uh, prediction accuracy. So what people uh, started doing a while ago, actually, is combining several models together. So instead of just one decision tree, they would build uh, maybe hundreds of decision trees and then get predictions from each one and combine them in certain ways. Uh, like uh, for, uh, there are different ways to combine predictions and those are called model ensembles. And model ensembles uh, are known to give uh, much better quality of the model. Uh, in particular, uh, some very popular uh, algorithms that are now widely used are Random Forest, uh, FGBoost, LightGBM. Th those are all uh, three ensemble models, actually. So uh, understanding that uh, you can build some of those models, uh, and those models are often uh, winning Kaggle competitions, so uh, they are pretty good and pretty efficient, too. But uh, if you have a big uh, ensemble of trees, then I guess you lose your explainability factor because you no longer can explain because you have 100 predictions and you combine them. It's very hard to explain this. Okay, um, so that was a very brief introduction to machine learning itself. And now let's talk about machine learning on Spark. And also, uh, yeah, I will show this picture in larger form. Uh, so uh, why, uh, actually, why did Spark uh, start existing? The initial impetus came from the fact that, uh, well, okay, you know that uh, data nowadays is huge, right? Not, not only now, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, data has become very, very big. It wouldn't just fit on a single computer, even a big one. So uh, Hadoop was invented, which uh, uses a distributed file system. And uh, there was this MapReduce paradigm, which uh, basically allowed uh, working with this data. But it was very slow when you try to implement uh, machine learning algorithms on Hadoop with the MapReduce. Uh, many of those um, machine learning models require several uh, data passes, sometimes even hundreds of data passes, passes through the data. 
And when you implement a machine learning algorithm, this is something that I did, and we worked with Hadoop, and it was very slow. Uh, so you you make a data pass, so you pass through those pieces of data on separate computers, and then you combine the results somehow, and then you start a new pass and combine results. And every time you write down all your results, and then you read them back in, and that makes it very very slow. And so uh, Spark was initially designed to resolve this problem, to avoid this writing and reading of the uh, interpreted files all the time. And Spark uh, was shown to accelerate some of the machine learning algorithms, like up to 100 times. Probably it was very special setup for this 100 times, but it was uh, at least 10 times faster with Spark than with uh, Hadoop. Uh, and uh, as uh, Shatabdi told us, the first version of Spark was using RDD, mm. and the first machine learning library was called uh, Spark ML Leap, and was based on RDDs. Uh, now that library is in maintenance mode. It's not deprecated; it can still be used. But uh, now uh, everybody is advised to use the new one called Spark ML, and this one is uh, based on data frames. And uh, as I understand, SparkML originally had a uh, few algorithms than SparkML Leap, but slowly it's uh, uh, catching up and getting all the algorithms in there. Now, uh, if you want to build some models, well, most often you don't just take your data, you build a model and you are done. It's more complicated than that. There is a whole process which starts with uh, data collection. You get your data from somewhere, and maybe even combine data from different data sources, whatever you, you find your data, collect, uh, ingest somehow, so convert it into data frame or something like that. Then you need to clean and transform the data. And that's also not trivial, and actually this sometimes takes like 80% of the time of the data a scientist, and then you start uh, building models on your data. And when you are building models, maybe you find that there are problems, and maybe you need to create some new features. So there is feature engineering, etc. So maybe add some new data transformations. So it's all uh, non non straightforward. It goes back and forth all the time. And you train you train different models with different parameters. Um, uh, there is this thing called hyperparameter optimization, where uh, you you say, okay, maybe this model has a few parameters, and this parameter can have this value or this or this. Like for example, if you are building a random forest, maybe you want to have 50 trees in the forest, maybe 100, maybe 200, so you, and then uh, there are different parameters, maybe for stopping criteria or something else, and you want to try all the combinations to find the optimal one. So all this uh, happens, and uh, ev uh, when you are doing this, uh, very often you divide your model into training and testing, so you keep a part of your data away from model building step, so that you can test your model on this new data and see how well it generalizes. Because your model is most likely will work well on your training data, but if it doesn't work well on your testing data, then it's no good. It's called uh, overfitting. And then you go back and uh, you try different models so that you, you, your error on the testing data should be comparable to that on the training data. And once all this is done and you finally have a model that you are happy with, then you need to deploy the model into production. And that's a separate step which I actually love to talk about, but I'm not sure if I will be talking about it today. Probably won't have enough time. But anyway, if you are interested, I can always talk to you about model deployment. I have worked for many years on some open standards for predictive model deployment. OK, uh, so uh, now uh, let's uh, just uh, make sure we understand some main terms used in this, and then uh, we'll go to some code examples. So one of the terms is data frame. And I think uh, Shatabdi already explained data frame well enough. 
so basically, it's kind of similar to the data framing in Python, if you are familiar with that, in Pandas. Uh, so it's like a, basically a table from a database, from a relational database. There are <coughs> various columns of different types, and uh, they have names, and they have rows, which are cases. And then um, in uh, Spark, there are those um, terms transformer and estimator. So a transformer is an algorithm which uh, takes a data frame and produces some new data frame. And an estimator is an algorithm uh, which can be fit on a data frame to produce a transformer. So uh, we will see today some examples of those. Uh, but for example, yeah, if you have a regression model, uh, it is an estimator first. Um, when you build it on the data, you get the model itself, which, you, which can act as a transformer because it can produce predictions for the new cases. And then pipeline is another important uh, uh, term. And that uh, is uh, a term that allows us to chain uh, multiple transformers and estimators together. And uh, this together sometimes is also called ML workflow. And basically what you are doing with your data usually you, is you are building your pipelines, which is a set of, transfer, uh, set of data transformations and models. Well, once you build a model, it's also a transformer because it gives you the predictions and then maybe you need to add additional transformations on top of that, whatever you need to do. And then parameter, well, all those transformers and estimators, they have uh, parameters which are specific to each one, but there is a common API for setting uh, and getting those parameters so that it's uh, more or less uh, uniform. Okay, now uh, maybe we could uh, try to do some coding. And uh, I don't know if you want to try to do coding right now uh, as I'm speaking or maybe later. It's up to you. So uh, David uh, told me about this Databricks Community Edition. Uh, you can go to this uh, uh, <clears throat> to this link. Let me put it in chat. And you can sign up uh, for this Community Edition where you can uh, just uh, run some Spark jobs easily. Or um, you can go to this link that Mary provided uh, for IBM Cloud, and then you would need to open Watson Studio. And uh, in Watson Studio, it is possible to create Jupyter Notebooks with Spark environment and uh, run some examples in there. Or you can just watch what I show you, and then uh, we can discuss later. And if you are not using this Databricks one, then um, in the Databricks, there is uh, uh, built-in uh, thing that uses this diamonds uh, CSV uh, data file that you can find on GitHub. So let me uh, see how I can put this into into the chat. Where is my chat? Do I have a chat here? Uh, don't know if I can. Can I go to chat from here? Oh, Yes. I don't know. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you said you the chat? Or... Yeah. But okay. since I'm sharing the screen, I... I... Ah, maybe... Ah, okay. It may be yeah, here. To... Oh, okay. Yeah. Top, yeah, if you're sharing the screen. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I see chat. Hey. So let me put some links there so you can have them. Oh, but I can't. Uh, okay, well, anyway, you see my screen so you can write down those. Right? Uh, for diamonds, I just googled diamonds.csv and it gave me this link immediately. <clears throat> and the, the link for the 
policy check now. Ah, oh, but I cannot copy this. Okay. Oh, never mind. So you see this Databricks one? Okay, that is my slide now. Solana, I, I got that. Okay. The Databricks, I, yeah. Ah. yeah. Yeah, I thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. So, I, I got it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, they have different versions, the different diamond. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the data looks like this. We have uh, variables. Uh, Karat, cut, color, etc. So you can see that uh, this variable karat looks like a continuous variable, and uh, so are depths and uh, table and price and x y z. And then those variables cut, color, and clarity they look like categorical variables. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in order to use uh, machine learning in uh, Spark ML, uh, we need to have numeric data, just like uh, with uh, Skykit Learn. Uh, for me, it's uh, a little strange because I'm very used to SPSS product where you just give it the data you have and it will take care of you, uh, of the encoding, etc. for you. But with open source, you have to do it all yourself manually. I'm not sure about H2O, actually. There is H2O, which is open source, and it runs on Spark. Maybe it uh, helps to... So I, I'm not familiar with it, but maybe we should uh, look into it and see. Maybe next time we should present about it. Maybe it helps to do this. But in, uh, so far, we have to do it manually. I mean, not completely manually. We have to write code to do it. So we need to do uh, to encode those strings with integers and then to apply one hot encoding. And here we have uh, some Python code for uh, encoding the strings with integers. So here I have uh, I imported pipeline and imported string indexer. So the string indexer is the file which uh, does the encoding of strings. Uh, so my diamonds, I just call it DF because uh, to make it shorter. Um, so here we have uh, those indexers. Uh, uh, so it's a little bit of a Python uh, <coughs> disk comprehension, I guess. Um, so I take those three variables, cut, color, and clarity, and I'm encoding them into into the same names plus underscore index. And we do the fit here. And then uh, we pipeline. So we put together all those stage stages. So those will be different stages for the pipeline, all those three uh, encoders. Although it, I think in um, Spark 3.0, which came out this year, I think now you can do several things at the same time. But pr prior to that, you had to use something like this this to encode several variables. So you do the pipeline of those and you do fit and transform. And then when we look at the results, here are the results. So uh, my uh, now uh, those cut index, color index, and clarity index, those are the variables that have been encoded with integers. Interesting. And the same code in Scala will look uh, kind of similar. Well, here I just gave you an example for just one variable. But it... Uh, so in Scala, you also have this uh, import or in Excel, and then uh, you set input column and output column, just like before, and uh, you say feed and transform. So basically, there is very uh, little difference. Well, one difference is that in Scala you have this wall that you have to put in, in front of things. And then it figures out the type. And in Java, well, in Java you have to specify the types of the things that you are using, you're producing. 
So again, there is a string indexer class, uh, and um, you set input column, output column, and um, otherwise it's very similar. So you can see that uh, those different APIs are very, very similar to each other, which is convenient. So you can pick whichever one is more convenient for you. Uh, but um, one thing about Java that uh, David told me, because David uh, was, is an expert in Spark, uh, that uh, with um, Python and Scala, you can do things, um, uh, you know, in a Jupyter notebook, you, you change code a little bit and you run it, and that's very easy and quick. And with Java, you cannot really do that. You have to have your code somewhere, and you compile it every time you change it. And that's why data scientists usually do not use uh, Java when they're doing this exploration. Maybe once they figured out what to do, then uh, maybe for deployment they can use Java. But for this, uh, most of the time of data scientists uh, is spent, uh, you know, Playing with the code, change a little bit and see, okay, does it look better? Does it work better now? And for that, um, Scala and uh, Python are the tools. And uh, performance, I think, uh, shut up, you mentioned that performance is about the same now for our world. Okay, so, yes. Uh, sorry? Yes, yes, the performance is about the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can pick whichever language you prefer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have encoded the as integers, but uh, in order to use them in this, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, I want to build a probably a linear regression model in order to predict my price. And price is continuous variable. So for regression models, I have to in, uh, use one hot encoding to encode, uh, to, to create those dummy variables from my uh, encoded categorical variables. And uh, in uh, Python, there is this uh, one hot encoder class, but uh, it is different from, uh, from one hot encoder in uh, Pandas because there is this uh, attribute drop last, which in uh, Spark by default is true. What does it mean? So here is a picture just explaining what one hot encoder is for those who are not familiar uh, well, for one hot encoding you take a categorical variable and then for example if it has three different categories you create three variables and they would have uh, values one when the category matches and value zero when it doesn't match and those are called dummy variables so one hot encoder uh, takes care of creating those dummy variables and in pandas if you use one hot encoder then uh, in Python, you get as many columns here as you had categories. Uh, in Spark, by default, you get one less. You don't get the last one. And the reason is uh, because if you are building, for example, a, a regression model uh, with intercept, then uh, the last category will always, will always be redundant. And so it automatically removes it. Because uh, they all, if you have all three, then they sum up to one, constant one, which is the uh, same as intercept. And that's why um, they decided to drop the last one. And uh, for one hot encoder, you can specify your input columns and output columns, or you can just specify one of those. So here you would need uh, to have a list, uh, and here just a single one. Yeah, so... Uh, don't forget about this drop last uh, that makes a difference. So I, I set it to, uh, when I wrote my code, I set it to false so that, yeah, drop last is false, so that I uh, keep, the, <clears throat> keep them the way I'm used to. Okay, so here is the code that applies one hot encoder in Python. Uh, between versions 2.3 and 3.0 of Spark, uh, this class was called one hot encoder estimator. And then in 3.0, they dropped the estimator part, so it's just one hot encoder. And here I was using uh, Python 2.4, I think so. And uh, in Watson Studio, we only support 2.4, as I understand. So 
uh, I'm using one half encoder estimate. And uh, so what happens here? Okay, I say my input columns, which are cut index, cut color index, and clarity index. Those are the encoded indices that I made. And then the output co uh, columns, uh, I call them hot hot, color hot, and clarity hot. And I want to drop last to be false. So again, uh, I call the fit. So the fit will figure out how many categories there are, so how many uh, new uh, variables to create, and then uh, transforms. Uh, transform would uh, apply this. Uh, so remember, this is estimator, and it produces a transformer, and then we use the transformer to actually create those new columns. And when we look at the result, uh, yeah, when we look at the result, results look a little strange here. Uh, not uh, so. If you do it in uh, pandas, you will just get all those new dummy columns. But here, uh, you get a sparse representation for them because we know that only one column would have uh, a value one. All the others will be zero. So. Uh, it's kind of uh, more compact representation to have this sparse uh, <clears throat> representation. It looks a little different, but it's, it's good. And when we go to modeling part, then it will understand those things. Uh, and when I talked to David uh, recently, right before this, he told me, oh, you know what? There is a better way to do this one hot encoding. Because if you use Coalas, in calls, there is method get dummies, uh, same as uh, with uh, uh, pandas. So just use get dummies and uh, don't use uh, one hot code. Okay. As I told you, I'm not a very big expert. And one hot encoding in Scala? Well, in Scala, I don't think we have koalas. Koalas are specific to Python. So I guess, uh, I don't know if in Scala there is a, a different way to do it, but the one that I found was uh, using this one hot encoder. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, well, basically similar syntax as before. So we also need to fit and transform. By the way, are there any questions so far? Because I've been talking for a while. No question? Okay. Well, when you do have questions, you can put them in chat. <clears throat> okay, so in Java, uh, there is also one hot encoder. And again, um, the syntax is slightly different, but uh, pretty similar. And again, you, you do the fit and transform, and everything is great. Now, another transformation that is uh, very often done with uh, data before you build models is missing value imputation. And by the way, the data that I'm working with now for this uh, startup, it has lots of missing data. I have many difficulties with that. So with missing value, uh, with missing values, what can you do? Sometimes if you don't have too many of them, maybe you could just uh, remove the cases that have uh, missing values and that's OK. Um, also, some uh, machine learning algorithms allow missing values and can deal with them. In particular, in SPSS, decision trees can deal with missing values. But then I found recently that uh, in uh, SkyKit Learn, uh, decision tree cannot deal with missing values, which is uh, very strange. Because uh, normally, uh, the correct algorithm for decision trees, uh, there, are, there are ways to deal with missing but in SkyKit Learn, they don't. Uh, and I'm not sure if decision trees in Spark ML uh, can deal with missing or not. I, I should find out this. Sorry, I didn't. <clears throat> so uh, if you have too many missing in various places, you don't want to just remove all the cases with missing, then you have to try to impute, replace them with some, some valid values, which is called impute missing. And the Spark has class imputer. Uh, which is very similar to simple imputer in SkyKit Learn. And it has options for if you want to impute your missing value for continuous variables, either with a mean value or a median value, you can do that. Um, 
As I understand, at least before 3.0, imputer could not deal with categorical variables, only with continuum. Uh, but usually, if people have categorical variables and they want to impute missing, then uh, they would use um, uh, the mo uh, mode, which is uh, most frequently found uh, category to impute uh, missing categorical variables. And also, I'm a strong believer that uh, imputation of missing should be done with understanding of uh, domain. Because that, depending on your domain, there may be some very clear way to impute missing values. I remember when Shatabdi and I did this um, imminent data science data zone in 2018, two years, more than two years ago, uh, there was this data with many missing values. And for different uh, variables, just based on some common sense, you would use very different ways to impute missing values. I think just uh, always taking the mean is uh, maybe not the best approach. You, you need to un understand a little more about what it means and uh, depending on that, impute differently. Yeah, with imputer, you can use mean, median, or you can use uh, your specified value, I think. So sometimes maybe you just value is a better choice. But in our case with the diamonds, we don't have missing, which is good. So we don't have to worry about that part. Okay, uh, now let's try to build that model. Uh, well, in order to, bid, to build a model in Spark, uh, I need to have two columns, features and labels. So um, for the features, I collect all my variables, which uh, I'm going to use as predictors, so I don't uh, use those uh, original string variables or even the uh, index uh, encoded parts because they're not the final ones, but I'm using the hot encoded ones, plus all the continuous fields that we had in the data. So I put all those names into this feed calls uh, variable, and I import the vector assembler which is a class that allows you to assemble uh, the fields that you need. So I specify my input columns and, um, and the output, there is a one output column called features. And um, so this assembler just does the transformation, it doesn't need to fit anything because it doesn't need to learn anything. It has all the information that it needs. So we apply transform and then we look at the result. Uh, and then another thing here is, um, as I mentioned before, uh, you usually split your data into training and testing so that you could test your model before, before you can claim that it's very good, you need to test it. And the model I'm trying to build here is the simplest uh, linear regression model, uh, which in general has this uh, equation y equals a plus bx. Uh, you know, the one-dimensional form of it is studied in middle school, I think. Um, <clears throat> but in general, your x is uh, your set of predictors, which probably you will have several, so you will have a matrix here. And this is uh, called the intercept. Yeah, so the b are the coefficients. No, the matrix, uh, I'm sorry, uh, x is the matrix, b is a set of coefficients. Okay, and... Um, so the code for linear regression is, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't show you the data which was transformed. Okay, I'll show it later. Yeah, so in order to build this uh, linear regression model, uh, I import uh, linear regression from PySpark ML regression. And I create an instance of it, and I specify my features, features and uh, labels. Label is a target variable, basically. And... Um, and then I, uh, and, uh, I could also specify some, some of the parameters for the linear regression, but they have some default values, which hopefully are good for me. And then we call this method fit on this LR, on the training data. And then we can look at coefficients. And when we look at the coefficients, we get uh, this vector of coefficients, plus there is a value for intercept that didn't fit on this slide. Right. Uh -huh. <clears throat> It was like 3,000 something. Uh, and then we can also look at some of the uh, output from, the, from this model uh, building part, uh, which is called training summary. And we can get it from this model uh, 
model object. And in the summary, we have total iterations. So there are iterations because uh, there was some regularization going on. And uh, you can get uh, objective history. So um, what was happening was some kind of loss function was uh, minimized. Uh, so there was some predefined uh, loss function that included, uh, you know, ax plus b minus y squared uh, plus uh, some regularization terms. And then we were trying to minimize the error. Or, yeah, so. And so we can see the objective history. And we can see mean squared error and R squared. R squared is this um, measure of uh, quality for regression models that is often used. Here we can look at the output. OK, so we had 44 iterations. And the objective history, so it started, whatever objective function was used, started at 0.49, and then it went down pretty fast originally. And then you see, in the end, it was almost not changing. And that probably triggered the stopping condition for the iterations to stop. And root mean squared error is this number, which I don't know how to interpret. It depends on the magnitude, magnitude of your target uh, <coughs> variable. But R squared is very clear. 0 0.91, 0 0.92, that's pretty good. So R squared is always between 0 and 1. And close to 1 means uh, that uh, the quality uh, that the model explains most of the variability in the target variable, which is good. So you want this closer to 1. Uh, and then how do we do the same things with Scala? Well, in this case, um, again, we import uh, this um, regression, linear regression, and uh, we create the object of linear regression. And we, in this case, we set some of the parameters so we can see what parameters there are. So you can set max iteration, but well, probably 10 is not enough. But it's up to you if you want to just quickly get something. And then some regular parameters and elastic net parameters. So those are related to uh, parameters related to regularization. I can talk about regularization if you want, or we could talk about other things. Uh, OK, and then again, we call the method fit. And then we print out uh, all, the, all those things as before. And for model summary in Scala, again, we get the training summary from the model. And then we print uh, certain things and hopefully get the same results. And I think actually, all right, uh, I didn't talk about um, model serialization, which is an important topic. OK, maybe we'll talk about it a little bit. OK, uh, now Java. Uh, with Java, Again, the code is very, very similar. So basically, just some syntax uh, sugar difference, but otherwise, it's almost the same in Java. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I also read that uh, once you serialize the model in uh, Spark, in any of those three languages, you can actually read this model uh, in any of the other languages, other three languages, and uh, it will still work. There is also support for another language called R. Uh, hopefully you heard about R, which is a pretty popular uh, open source language. Uh, especially statisticians use uh, R a lot. It has uh, like 17,000 different uh, uh, packages. Uh, they have very good statistical analysis in many of them. So R is also supported on Spark. Uh, there is a special version of R supported on Spark. Uh, but there is a little bit of um, difference. Uh, so you cannot just save a model if you built it in R in Spark and then read it with those other languages. I think there would be problems. So R is kind of a little bit separate. OK, I think that's all I had in terms of slides. But uh, uh, if you are not very tired, we could look at some of the other things uh, that are there. 
and um, we can discuss. And I would really like to hear if you have any questions. Oh, yeah. And if you want, we can also look at how all those things work in when we <clears throat> run them somewhere. So um, here are some of the links that could be useful. Um, well, I guess I can stop the. Okay. Let's see. I'll go Sv stop. Yeah, Svetlana. Yes. There's a, there's a question from Tony. Oh. Asking, okay. Is there a parameter or method that will give an F statistic and F statistics and correlation matrix? matrix. Are you sure it's correlation matrix or? Oh, well, yeah, okay. There could be covariance matrix, correlation matrix, uh, yeah. Okay, F statistic, I think that's for, ah, well, yeah, F statistic. Well, for, for logistic regression or something, there is F1 statistic, but F statistic is different. Yeah, it's a statistical parameter. Oh, yeah, I know uh -huh. uh, I'm sure there is something. Uh, well, I'm I'm not so sure about um, covariance matrix for the model. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can do the correlation matrix. And um, yeah, so those statistics. Um, yes, I believe the, there are methods for this, and we can search for them. Let me stop sharing my screen. And uh, oh, I just lost. Yeah, those are very good questions. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, there will be uh, so there will be one way ANOVA and two way ANOVA also, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, shut up. Do you have something to show about this? Uh, no, I I, I wonder. Um, um, it, uh, in Python, there would be some um, method to do the ANOVA, so we need to know the variables. I, I'm I don't I'm not um, sure amount of uh, right now what is the method, but for correlation, it will be dot co c o r r. Ah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But okay. Uh, um, the ANOVA, the F uh, statistics, I don't know what it is. How, how to get that? Which method to get that? Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I see there is um, MLLib statistics. Okay. Let me, let me show you. I'm trying to make the font bigger. And somehow it doesn't. No, it's not working. Okay, yeah. So um, it says here that uh, call stats returns an instance of multivariate statistical summary which contains the column-wise marks, mean, mean, variance, and number of non-zeros. Okay, that's not enough. Ah, we're looking for, ah, correlations. Yes, there are correlations. So uh, it's a package called statistics. You see, uh -huh, it's in MLLib. So I guess it's not in Spark ML, but it is in MLLib. Uh, so MLLib stat statistics, and um, there is statistics dot uh, core. Okay. Can you see on my screen, or is it too small? It is small, but it it's okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, definitely, there is something for this. Svetlana, uh, yes. thank you. I, I can read the uh, documentation on the MLLib. 
I think you found exactly what I need. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this should have, and you see, it's very convenient that Spark documentation has Scala, Java, and Python tab. So you can see exactly how to do it in any of the languages. So all in one place. That's very nice of them. The documentation is pretty nice, I believe. Yeah, I think once I'm sharing this screen, I cannot do it. Okay. Um, all right. Or maybe, yeah, something is slow here. Okay, so if you want, uh, we can look at this. Uh, so I was running this uh, code that I was showing you in this uh, window of uh, Databricks, Databricks Community Edition. And somehow, ah, okay, that's very slow. My computer is slow. Okay. Um, so I wanted to show you, yeah, so here we did this one hot encoding. And then I did, um, And I did this um, features. Yeah, the features look like this. So uh, I don't know if you can see. Basically, the whole row is uh, represented as sparse row. So there are the indices of the values and then the values. And then, uh, uh, yeah, we have the coefficients here. And what else? There was something else. Oh, yeah. I wanted to show you also. So uh, we were talking about uh, building models, and there were also models for yeah all the other mod machine learning models because of course linear regression is one of the simplest models, and uh, you need to be careful when you can use it. Yes, so uh, you have to have continuous target. You have to assume that the target is uh, normally distributed, right? So you have to have some kind of assurance that the target is more or less normally distributed. And also that your cases are all independent of each other. And if those um, assumptions are not true, then uh, you may need to use some other models. Otherwise, uh, if you make such assumptions and uh, you build your model, uh, well, you may get into trouble because it may be not correct assumption. Um, so another thing was here. Uh, Anna, there's a question from uh, Rakesh. Oh, oh, another question? Okay, what is the question? Yeah, it says, let's say you have a machine learning model to production and performs in a disappointed fashion. What would be the feedback loops, uh, loop uh, process, and uh -huh. retraining and re redeployment, right? Done in production. Can you please explain the process you have seen in production? So. Excellent question. Yes, uh, I should I should have mentioned yes that the model deployment again is not the very last step because you have to monitor your model how it behaves in production. So uh, because uh, the trends and the data change. And so the model that was uh, very good uh, one day could become terrible another day. So there are tools that do model monitoring somehow. And uh, they allow you to set a threshold. Uh, in particular, I believe in uh, Watson machine learning, there is, uh, there is this tool called uh, OpenScale uh, that um, you can specify uh, how bad you want your model to become until um, while it, it can still remain in production. But of course, yeah, you have to constantly monitor it. And once it becomes too bad, then you need to update or replace the model. And so um, I don't have uh, too much experience with uh, practical uh, production. Uh, but I believe that uh, people constantly monitor and uh, update uh, their models and uh, replace them when they get uh, not so good. Um, and uh, in particular, those open standards that I mentioned, like PMML or PFA or Onyx, uh, those open standards allow you to very quickly replace the models in production. 
So if you want, I can talk about uh, those uh, open standards, but uh, actually I think maybe we don't have that much time left. Uh, so I wanted to also show you something about ML flow because it's kind of related. Uh, well, this is a picture from from ML flow. Yeah, so ML flow is um, where do we have another picture? Um, it's another thing from Databricks, which uh, basically helps to deploy models into production. And also it helps to uh, keep track of your different experiments. As I said, you when, while you are developing model, you try all the different things. And uh, each try is uh, sometimes called experiment. And you need to keep track of those experiments and uh, in order to find which one was the best. And this is one of the... Uh, illustrations from how they keep some information from this um, experiments and um, there was something else too no oh. okay yeah, no, um, i'm sorry the screen yeah. or are ah, you sharing right. the screen okay. i didn't share the screens uh, sorry oh no problem okay so let's see uh, yeah, so what uh, what you, would you uh, like to discuss? I can talk about open standards for machine learning. If you want or we can just... Um, oh, yeah, I want to talk more about um, different models that there are. Yeah, I haven't really showed you many models in uh, Spark, right? Where was that? So many different um, blogs that I found uh, talking about those things. It's amazing. Um, I'm sorry. It's somewhere. Any more questions? No? Yeah, here. Thanks. My computer is a little slow. Now it, it has become okay. Yeah, I guess I can show it. Shetlana. Yes. Uh, Kumar is asking, uh, where can we find the list of available ML uh, DL models, the standard models? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, deep learning, uh, we didn't cover today deep learning, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, deep learning is not part of Spark ML, but uh, I believe uh, Spark has uh, support for uh, for some deep learning, uh, which I think I will probably need to look more uh, to, <clears throat> to not mislead you, but I, I believe, yeah, there is uh, support for GPU, uh, for using GPU for deep learning. GPU is graphical processing unit, of course. And uh, here is, um, uh, if you can see my screen now, uh, sparkapache.org uh, docs latest ML classification regression HTML. This, uh, I believe, has a list of all the algorithms that there are. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I can put it in chat. Yeah, I put in chat the link to this uh, page. So it has a very good uh, explanation and uh, it has. Yeah. 
Hey, it has examples again. Oh, in all four languages here, which is very nice. So basically, as I mentioned before, preparing your data <laughs> takes the most time. Uh, actually, uh, just uh, building a model, well, you, you just say, okay, you have your data prepared, then you just create an object of whatever model you wanted, you set some parameters, and then you just and well, of course, depending on the size of your data, since Spark was designed for very large distributed data, it can take a while to actually get results from the feed. Uh, but in terms of programming, uh, this is the easiest part. So your computer may need to work, or your cluster may need to work hard to actually uh, compute the model. But uh, this is very simple. And uh, yeah, another thing is that with MLflow, I believe you uh, it uh, has the tools that allow you to do uh, this hyperparameter optimization. So you specify, okay, I want to try these parameters and these parameters, and it would uh, run everything for you and give you the best results. And that's very convenient. So, um, and also it will probably use cross-validation to make sure you you get the best models. What are the best prominent ML frameworks? Great question. Uh, yes, so what are the best in prominent? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, I guess it depends on how you look at it. And so I think the most um, Widely known one is uh, SkyKit Learn. Do you agree, Shatabdi? Shatabdi, you are mute. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Yeah. Did you so, uh, SkyKit Learn is the most uh, famous one. Um, okay, sorry, sorry, I just stepped out. Uh, so, is your question: What are the best prominent ML frameworks? ML yes. models? Uh, yes, I think that that depends. So, you can the logistic uh, regression, linear regression, decision tree. They are the um, state of the art, um, like model, basic model. You can never go wrong with that. Uh, so you, you can you can consider those are like um, uh, those, okay. those are very good to learn, but but the, but the modern ensemble models and deep learning models they they are also best performing models. They are, they are best performing with uh, terms of accuracy, but in terms of explainability or understanding, you you, you can go, you can never go wrong with uh, linear regression, logistic regression, or decision tree. Okay, thank you, Shatabdi. I think the question was more about frameworks, and frameworks are like uh, maybe SkyKit Learn or mm -hmm. R packages mm -hmm. or uh, the Spark ML. I think Spark ML is uh, pretty high on that hierarchy, especially for big data. I think it's one of the top ones. Uh, but there are also several open source and commercial products uh, that. Uh, oh, somebody. Somebody lists a lot of things here. Yeah, uh, yeah. For, flow, yeah. For deep learning, for deep learning, definitely it's TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, I think are the two most uh, famous ones. Um, and uh, yeah, Microsoft also has uh, its own. Uh, well, now you know the, there are those all those clouds, and each cloud has their own um, machine learning. Uh, so. Azure uh, is Microsoft Cloud, and it has a lot of um, analytics in there. And uh, I know that uh, they use Onyx to easily transfer models between different um, uh, products, and that helps them a lot. Uh, with um, uh, Amazon, there is SageMaker, right? And they, they have uh, lots of stuff there. And then, of course, uh, IBM Cloud has Watson Studio, Watson Machine Learning. Uh, the, there are many, many things in there as well. Uh, with IBM Cloud, you can get a free account uh, and you can look at many things there. Uh, which one to choose when? 
Yeah, <laughs> that's a hundred million question. Uh, um, well, uh, it, it, first of all, you have to figure out, do you have small to medium data or do you have uh, huge distributed data? Well, if you have huge distributed data, then your problem needs Spark. Um, if your data is not so huge, R or Python uh, could be preferable. And I think, I find that uh, R has, um, well, I like R more than Python, to be honest with you. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, in R there are kind of more statistical uh, features and also for example, you know, there is this Iris data set, uh, very toy, simple toy example. Uh, if you build a SkyKit Learn decision tree uh, on this Iris data set, you get a tree of depth 10. That's just way overfitting. You don't want to do that. So the default parameters um, maybe not the best in SkyKit Learn. Uh, if you build that decision tree with R, you, you get a reasonable tree. So. That's just one example, but it shows. Um, so, yes, so Spark, just, Spark also uh, has a Spark NLP. Uh, so in terms of natural language processing, uh, again, there are different tools for natural language processing. And uh, Spark NLP, I don't think it's, a Spark, it's part of Spark ML, I think it is separate. And I wanted to do something about it, too, but didn't have enough time for that. Um, yeah, for natural language processing, now state of the art is uh, using deep learning uh, with uh, recurrent neural networks like LSTM, GRU. Um, yes, there is a lot of that going on. Um, ah, there is also BERT uh, network. I don't know if you heard about that. Uh, I heard that it kind of and GPT-3 or something like that. Uh, yeah, with natural language processing, there are recently a lot of uh, big successes and it's developing very fast. Very good questions, thank you. Any more questions? So, okay, so I actually have a question. I mean, in terms of like, um, for real processing, is, is it still like how, you know, data is being read in and processed in real time, or is it in general you are batching, you know, batch up, you know, and, and processing your data in batches? Um, how is it in general being handled, you know, in like current like machine learning processing? I'm oh, you curious. mean when you have streaming data? Oh. That's kind of coming in, you process it as it comes in, uh, like in a distributed. Yeah, yeah, that's called, um, that's called streaming data. And there is Spark streaming. Okay. Yeah. Spark streaming is a whole subset of uh, Spark mm -hmm. where yeah. you uh, basically it works like it collects small mini batches of the data and attaches them to the data frame. So, yeah. so that um, the process can work with the data frame as if it's a normal data, frame, but actually it keeps updating, adding new cases to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it is done in Spark. Um, there is an alternative framework uh, or several. Okay. Link, Apache Flink maybe, right? Uh, which uh, deals with it slightly differently. Sure. Yeah, that's an interesting area also to discuss. So that must be the dog Kafka, for example, right? Like Kafka. Yeah, screen. right. Kafka too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are so many things um, one can learn all the time. Uh, okay. Now, uh, there is a good question. Any good resource course to learn data science for a software developer? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, there are many great courses like Coursera, EDX, uh, Udemy. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this uh, website called cognitiveclass.ai, which gives uh, some very introductory, but very quick and free uh, lessons. Uh, another good uh, good resource is Kaggle, you know, Kaggle.com. It has um, not only competitions, it has lots of uh, uh, teaching, learning uh, materials where you can 
Yeah, so uh, Coursera definitely is a very nice resource and you can audit courses. Yeah. Uh, Udemy, there is also EDX. Um, uh, Udacity. There are so many different courses uh, right now. Uh, on LinkedIn also there are many courses and if you go to your local uh, through the website of your local library you may might be able to get uh, free access to this linda.com uh, through your local library you can get free access and there are many courses I I don't know exactly which courses they have but uh, could be good to look yeah, cognitive class AI. This um, there are uh, simple uh, classes, simpler classes. Everything is free. Would be good starting point. Uh, but on Coursera, I think there is this classical course uh, on machine learning by um, Andrew Ng. That's considered classic uh, for machine learning. I think it's a Stanford course. I think Andrew basically founded the course here. Very good questions. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions? Well, uh, I guess, um, yeah, keep, uh, well, I mean, if you have any more questions later, you can always find us on uh, on LinkedIn or on uh, Twitter. So, okay. there is my Twitter handle. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, it's always if anybody has questions, you... Is, uh, send it on the on the meetup page too. You can post a right meetup yeah. also. Yes, so yeah. you can contact us by LinkedIn or meetup. Yes, thank you all so much for attending.